Good evening, everyone. My name is Marina Iskro, and I'm Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Thank you so much for joining me and Paul Pfeiffer in conversation as part of the museum's weekly artist talk series, Talking to Our Time. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpretation are provided for tonight's program. Um, and you can find information about using both of those options in the chat bar. Tonight, Paul and I will be speaking for about 40 minutes and then we will open up to audience Q&A. So if you'd like to submit a question, feel free to do that at any time using the Q&A button on Zoom. And now I'm honored this evening to introduce Paul Pfeiffer. Born in Honolulu and based in New York, Paul works in video, sculpture, and other formats to explore what lies beneath the mass media images that we encounter every day. His groundbreaking works address sports, game shows, beauty pageants, and movies with an attention to the sometimes violent ways that contemporary culture reduces human beings into consumers and objects to be consumed. Paul began practicing as an artist in the 1990s, but his works even from that early period continued to gain new resonances in our digital world in ways that feel unnervingly prescient. As we think about the ethics of circulating images online, particularly images of racialized violence and human suffering, Paul's practice provides a critical and empathetic perspective that feels more urgent than ever. So tonight I'm looking forward both to revisiting some of Paul's classic works um, from our contemporary viewpoint and to learning more about his exciting recent projects and works in progress. In recent years, Paul has had solo exhibitions at NCA Chicago, the Albright Knox, the Honolulu Museum of Art, Inhotim Institute of Contemporary Art in Brazil, and the Hamburger Bonhof in Berlin. He developed a major commission for the Performa Biennial in 2019. He's received numerous awards, including the Whitney Museum's inaugural Buxbaum Award in 2000. And his work is included in the collections of major museums worldwide, including the Hirshhorn. So welcome, Paul. I'm so pleased to have you here tonight. You can turn on your camera. Okay, I think you're, you're on mute. There you Hi, go. Marina. Hi, nice to see you. Um, so I thought we could start with um, one of your early sort of classic works called Fragment of a Crucifixion after Francis Bacon from 1999. Um, this is a, a video featuring the basketball player, Larry Johnson. And before we watch a clip from this video, um, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what initially drew you to sports imagery. I know that you didn't necessarily grow up in a sports family and weren't really into sports as a young person. So what drew you to this subject? Um, yeah, I, in retrospect, I would answer it one way. And, uh, but, and so in retrospect, I think that the arena and the scene of sports along with uh, the scene of mass religion. Um, these are two primary places where you see the innovation of the medium of video, um, which is a form of image making that I am just drawn to um, intuitively uh, in terms of how it can communicate and, and what, it's, it, what it uh, can say about um, how we perceive things and so forth. Um, that's how I look at it now, but um, it actually dates from the kind of mid nineties when uh, I went to uh, Madison Square Garden for the first time um, and saw uh, games there, both um, basketball games, specifically WNBA games. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just when the WNBA uh, rebooted um, so there was a lot of interest, um, and, um, some boxing matches as well. Um, and not being familiar with, with spectator sports at all. I was kind of immediately blown away, um, just yeah. by the kind of like the, the hyper visuality of, of the scene. Um, right. And I've, yeah, I've heard you talk about how you didn't necessarily have the background to understand, you know, the individual players and their histories and, you know, the relationships of different sports in the league. So you were sort of forced to look at the games in kind of more of a formal way. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe even like anthropological. Or anthropological, something. yeah. There um, you go. <clears throat> but I would also say like, you know, the, the title of this piece, which also is uh, like one of the first uh, videos that I experimented with making, um, a fragment of a crucifixion speaks to, in a way, what I saw um, at that inception of like being in Madison Square Garden. Right. Um, the title refers to a painting by Francis Bacon written in, I mean, uh, painted in 1950. And uh, the two really quickly things that, that interest me about Francis Bacon's work, um, not just that painting. Um, one is, you know, this is like right after World War II, a kind of like very like intense existential exploration of maybe like what it is to be human. Um, or like the limits of what kind of, uh, you know, the human can sink to in a way or um, extend to. Yeah. And, and just, and secondly was the, um, uh, um, the way that he used the figure um, as a kind of um, vessel to explore that. Right, well, that's a great introduction to the video. So why don't we watch about um, 30, seconds of this and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, so to create this work, you essentially began with this very short video clip of Johnson celebrating a shot. Um, but as you repeat it over and over and over, the celebration kind of starts to take on the look of terror or um, almost pain. So I wonder if you could talk about kind of the device of the loop and how you see that functioning here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I. Uh... Um, you know, in a way, well, the loop uh, I discovered in like the early 90s is kind of the essential movement of digital video. Yeah. Um, and we all know that now, but, you know, it was sort of a, like, a, a new thing just emerging uh, in the early 90s. And, you know, uh, there, it was very novel. I was uh, teaching at Parsons at the time and uh, got to play around with these these just kind of new tools. and. The first thing that you would do is is scrub the video or like play it back and forth, um, and I found that to be provocative and and um, and mesmerizing. Yeah, um, I mean, so now again in retrospect, I mean, having thought about it for a long time, and been in many conversations about it, because now in some ways I think you know the loop is is possibly. One of the most, you know, is is the fundamental unit of communication now. Um, if you think about news bites, um, memes, uh, TikTok, TikTok, <laughs> um, literally, like uh, in a way, our our means of consuming moving images has been reduced to the loop in the most, you know, uh, complete way. Um, so it's always interested me that, uh, it, it, um, psychologically speaking, the loop. Um, has these particular resonances. Um, on the one hand, um, the loop is associated with, uh, with hypnosis. Mm. Um, the repeated sound or the repeated uh, moving light is what induces uh, the uh, hypnotic state or alpha brainwave state, um, which is considered to be the, the uh, mental state associated with the greatest sort of receptivity um, it would be, you know, if you wanted to quit smoking, it would be through alpha brainwave state that you would be able to access kind of subliminal patterns or uh, ingrained patterns and then rewire them. Um, 
what that says, I don't know, but uh, I find that association between the loop and a kind of heightened receptivity uh, verging on kind of altered consciousness, um, something that's like, like a form of response or maybe even knowledge that's nonverbal, but more somatic, you know, uh, relates to kind of the deeper wiring of, of human perception and human cognition. Yeah, that's amazing. On the I other hand, if, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, just uh, really quickly, the the other kind of psychological association um, would be uh, psychoanalytic, where the loop essentially would be a kind of telltale sign of a repressed trauma. Yeah, and I'm curious, like whether you see one of those models as sort of applying to this work. To me, at least, it's bringing out something that's kind of unconscious in the original video that suddenly becomes visible. Is that sort of how you understand it? Well, yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, starting with the heightened receptivity, yeah. I think uh, in a way the point of the image was less to, for me, the fascination with was with how this kind of simple looped image could be enigmatic and yeah. suggest many different things. Right. Um, yeah, as you said, you know, it, it's it's a moment of triumph and and an expression of like joy or or of uh, yeah of, of success, and at the same time uh, also could easily be read as as uh, the reverse of like some kind of um, existential pain or right or horror. Yeah, so that's how it was read in um, a recent article that I wanted to bring up. Again, this is a work from 1999. Um, but an article just came out recently by Marielle Ingram, I think it was this summer, um, about sort of racialized violence and spectacle. And she is thinking about the way images of Black suffering circulate on social media. So some of these images might be intended to spur people into action, but they end up kind of functioning simply as spectacle. Um, and Ingram actually proposes that your work um, on Black athletes specifically proposes an alternative to this mode in that it sort of like interrogates or reflects on the process of spectacle or spectacularization rather than simply repeating it. So I wonder, I'd love to hear your response to that reading of your work um, or just sort of how you imagine this kind of work existing in our current political context. Yeah, I mean, um... Obviously, uh, it's it's definitive of the moment in a way the uh, the murder of George Floyd and and the kind of um, global uh, response to it, um, which like I don't need to say is you know in a way been um, also enigmatic in 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 that um, there's no denying the kind of um, like the amazing um, force of uh, of um, like recognition of um, uh, a kind of systemic problem uh, um, and and of a galvanizing of of you know mass uh, response uh, that I suppose you know the like this kind of like hyper visual circulation. Of, of the the image of, of George Floyd's murder just you know triggers um, of course it's not the only one um, uh, and but it really like you know in a way allows for a kind of acknowledgement and a reckoning with just you know the uh, with with the endless series of such images and of such um, acts of violence um, so there is a sense of uh, a kind of uh, reckoning with uh, with a kind of repressed, or at least the repressed for some, uh, of something you know uh, very ingrained, and yet uh, kind of sunken um, uh, in 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 society and in American culture. Um, yeah, and at the same time. Um, you know the 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 speed at which uh, well the article that you reference um, you know describes how uh, 
like the uncanniness of um, the sort of like quick kind of way in which uh, the gesture of solidarity um, appeared to be rendered superficial by kind of its sort of um, blanket uh, uh, deployment by uh, every entity in the world, including, you know, the, the largest corporations in the world. Yeah. Um, so like it, in a way it tests kind of an understanding of what an empathic relationship is if it's uh, used like wallpaper yeah. um, in such a kind of ubiquitous, ubiquitous way. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, what that article was saying, I, I, I mean, it points to a kind of like a, the, it, it points to something that's going on that I, I, I would argue is hard to pin down. And um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, in some ways to me, uh, the, the nature of kind of coming to terms with a repressed trauma uh, is, it has something to me to do with, you know, acknowledging something that's fundamental, that's constitutive of, of identity um, and, and, you know, just simply like, you know, digging towards the truth of that uh, to me, it has a value in itself I think maybe, you know, the desire to kind of come to a resolution about such things yeah. is is not like the immediate point. Um, yeah, I don't think your work does that. Um, and I don't think she's arguing that it does either. I think she's seeing it as sort of descriptive of a situation as opposed to proposing right. a solution necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I will say that, uh, I mean, in, in a sense, you know, to prevent a kind of like premature resolution would in fact be the point. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, well, and, let's, yeah. yeah, no, go ahead. No, no, you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I was gonna move on to the next um, body of work, which shares some themes in common um, with the one we just discussed. So this is a series of photographs called Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, the one that we're seeing here on the screen is from the Hirshhorn's collection, but we'll look at a few of them. Um, so in addition to looping, like we just saw, another technique that you've often turned to is erasure. So in this series, you're um, sort of digitally removing details from photographs of basketball players. And you often describe this technique of removal as camouflage rather than erasure. So I wanted to ask you to sort of talk a little bit about that distinction, why camouflage? Yeah, the image that comes to mind uh, for me, that leads me to use the word camouflage is the image of uh, like an insect that uses camouflage to hide. Um, you know, there's many species of insects that will, uh, you know, transform their bodies in order to look like foliage. And so, uh, yeah, generally what I think of as a uh, um, the relationship in camouflage is a kind of relationship between foreground and background where the, the, the background would serve as a kind of like stage set or um, a kind of armature on which the object or the figure or the person, the personality would appear. That's to me our visual relationship between foreground and background. Right. Um, is sort of like object and absence. Um, so that what happens when, uh, when insects camouflage is they actually take, in a way they simulate elements of the background in order to disappear into it. Um, and uh, the process of working in Photoshop or uh, the equivalent in video um, actually ends up to be very much about uh, taking snippets of the background and then putting them over the figure that's in the picture in order to, um, you know, in order to erase it. Um, and that's why I think of, um, you know, uh, camouflage rather than just erasure. Um, it literally is taking pieces of the background and putting it into the foreground. It's also obviously to me, like very suggestive to think about this uh, relationship in terms of simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't mean to get so deep into it, but uh, I, I think, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the popular life of 
kind of wild theories of, of what's true or fake these days indicates that, you know, something about our time uh, causes a generalized doubt about whether things are as they really appear to be. And my sense is that has something to do with the kind of the speed and, and the nature of uh, um, the circulation of images via social media. Um, oh, yeah. the, the kind of state of hypermediation or hypervisual visuality that we're in. Right. Um, so it, it, it makes me think that in some ways, you know, what, what, we, what I'm describing is as uh, camouflage. If you think about the kinds of modes of operation that we associate now with our uh, political sphere, um, and uh, kind of the simulating of what's real um, mm -hmm. or the questioning of, of what's fake, um, that, that the world is rife with acts of camouflage. That's really interesting. That's great. So let's um, scroll through a few more um, photos from this series. I want to just ask you about some of the um, visual similarities among them. We can just go through a few more. Um, so a couple of things that I notice. One is you often gravitate toward um, moments in which the players' bodies are elongated. Often they're literally suspended in the air um, with their limbs extended. So I'm curious just um, in the kinds of references that you're thinking about with the figures here. And this one, for example, seems like a clear reference to sort of a crucifixion or a religious painting or sculpture. Could you talk a little bit about what sorts of references you might've had in mind? Yeah, well, um, uh, so all of these images come from, from the NBA archive, uh, which has somehow been folded into the Getty archive at this point um, and contains at this, you know, like millions of images. Uh, the NBA was founded in, uh, I think, 1946. Um, so, you know, we have like six decades or uh, more of images than every year many, many more images are added to the archive. Um, you know, there's like uh, specific photographers that I've come to see take pictures in very particular ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really it's, it's an amazing photographic archive and can be looked at for, for so many fascinating deal, uh, you know, details that have to do with history, that have to do with uh, the kind of technical conditions, the evolution of, of the game, um, the, player shorts going from like very like short and tight to like uh, long and baggy. Um, like this image is um, originates in the uh, in the period of NBA history when people were allowed to smoke inside uh, oh, wow. basketball. So this kind of bluish light that's in there has to do with the amount of uh, cigarette smoke that's in the air. Um, Anyway, yeah, like, I mean, the commonality of all of these obviously is that um, they're, they're meant to capture the, the action on the court and they're meant to feature whoever's, you know, playing well uh, in the game or that season. Um, so they're really like their hero shots, their action shots. Um, generally, so in, in that sense, I feel like they uh, owe a lot of their composition to a whole history of image. Uh, image making around um, heroes and, um, you know, whether they be like religious heroes or, um, you know, like political or social, um, the aristocracy, but, uh, you know, basically the, the, the kind of heroic pose um, that's captured by photographs over the decades uh, in these shots uh, owes a lot, I think, to the history of painting. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and figure painting, yeah. Right. So that's already sort of there at the moment of the photograph being taken. That reference is already sort of there in the general cultural imagination. It is, and I would say generally, you know, um, the operation that I, I that that kind of can be found in all of these has to do with uh, selecting images that contain details that, uh, when photoshopped, could bring out nuances that constitute a kind of contradiction. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is that these images are all meant to signify in a very specific way. Um, to erase uh, elements or, or rearrange them um, opens up a gap in that 
signifying chain or in, in that kind of right. meaning making chain that's occurring non-verbally in, in the image. And, and to do that has a correlation with a kind of intuitive way that we would read an image uh, by interrupting the intuitive way that we would complete the meaning of an image. Mm -hmm. um, it retains a gap, not unlike the one that you described in a uh, fragment of a crucifixion, right. where, uh, for example, if you um, chosen a, a figure whose face or even entire head were was hidden somehow by a limb or because their back was to the camera, it would contradict the kind of the, the sheer heroism. Of, yeah, I was going to ask you about those. We can scroll through again and just see how many of the faces are really obscured by like flashes of light or lens flares or or limbs. Yeah, it's great. Okay. In fact, in most of these shots, what's what's going on is the figure that's been retained. Um, obviously, many other figures have been removed. The figure that's been retained is usually not originally the star of the shot, but actually uh, somebody who's being thrown back by the star. Right. Um, and in a sense, a, a kind of a secondary or a marginal figure to that moment mm -hmm. is being pushed from the margin into the center. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in that way, um, becomes a kind of, um, you know, like a visual contradiction. Right, yeah. Well, I think that's actually a good segue to um, the next group of works that we were hoping to talk about, um, which is called the Caryatid series. So why don't we actually um, just jump right into one of the videos? I think we'll show maybe 30 seconds and then we can talk over it. Um, cool. Yeah, we can play Bronner from 2020. Okay, so I think we'll just continue talking as the video continues. Um, so in this series, you're obviously removing one boxer from a match. Um, again, this technique of camouflage now applied to a video work. Um, and we're left with the second boxer who seems to react to almost a series of kind of invisible punches. Um, I wonder if you could talk about kind of the, the bodily response that many people have to this group of works and why you think they might have that effect. Um, I mean, in, in a way to remove the attacking boxer uh, places even, I mean, to me more emphasis on the impact um, or say like the recoil. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose, you know, that it's, uh, there's really like a heightened um, kind of like visual emphasis on the violence. Um, I mean, I'll just then say that, you know, all of these uh, videos are, are made with um, footage that's uh, uh, coming off of YouTube. Um, so I, as you were saying earlier, like, you know, this, this, um, I mean, these are publicly available images that are um, circulating um, via social media. Um, and, the, and it's remarkable to me, like, you know, the, the degree of, of uh, the, I mean, the evolution of, of camera technology. Um, it's hard to tell uh, streaming it, but um, uh, we're looking at like super slow-mo shots. Um, it's a little bit choppy uh, viewing it through the zoom screen. Um, but in, in reality, uh, uh, this footage is super smooth. Um, so like the kind of the detail that's captured uh, of, of the impact of the moment and 
the kind of um, above normal frame rate to, to create this kind of smooth movement. Um, very like amazing technology and the way that it's being applied to images produced uh, almost like daily in the world of scenes like this to me is, is remarkable. In yeah. a way, this is a kind of counter archive of, of, this, of these scenes. Right. Could you talk about the title of the series, Caryatid? What is the reference there? Um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, I think it's the, the most immediate association is, you know, uh, on the um, Acropolis in Athens, there's um, one of the buildings uh, uh, on the Acropolis is called the, the, the Persian Porch. Um, and it is a porch. Uh, with six columns, and each of the columns takes the form of uh, a human form, uh, specifically a, um, a female human form, and those are the caryatids. Uh, they've been they've been used as a prototype, uh, and the way that what the caryatids are is it's a human figure that carries the weight of a building on its head um, as a column. Um, it's the only one of the classical columns that takes human form. You know, you have uh, several different kinds of uh, classical orders. Um, but the caryatid is, is, is particular in that it takes a human form. Um, I, at a certain point, I got uh, sucked into reading about classical architecture. And um, there's a, an amazing book called The Ten Books of Architecture of Vitruvius, Vitruvius yeah. <laughs> uh, who was the architect of, uh, of uh, Julius Caesar. Um, and he wrote this book as a kind of like gift to Caesar um, to train him in kind of the arts of kind of ruling society. Um, so it's not just about architecture, it's really about like how to be in power. And um, the first story in one of the, in the first chapter describes the Karyatids and, and basically the story, I don't, I don't mean to go on, but it's, I find it fascinating. The, those, those six women on the Persian porch represent the, um, the story of uh, an, uh, a city-state uh, that rose up against Athens in antiquity, um, attempted to overthrow uh, Athens as the central power at the time, and they failed. Um, and it was considered really the worst possible act of treason. And so uh, punishment was derived, which was to uh, create effigies of the wives of the general and to force them to um, first march in a kind of humiliating march as slaves, and then eventually to take a permanent form as, as these figures that would hold up the edifices of mm -hmm. Athens, the city-state of Athens. The idea was humiliation for all eternity. Wow. That's the karyatid. So like yeah. it's been, you know, there's, there's been many, many karyatids since. Um, and essentially, like I actually realized at a certain point that what it represents is the, from antiquity, the image of the slave. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's look really quickly at one of the um, installation shots from the series before we move on. I just wanna give people a sense of how these are actually displayed. There we go. Okay, so in some cases you have shown these um, sitting in these kind of chromed monitors directly on the floor. So I wonder if you could just say a quick word about those choices, both about kind of emphasizing the materiality of the, the apparatus that's playing the videos um, or that houses the videos and um, about the, the positioning of them so low that people have to sort of stoop down to watch them. Yeah, I, I'm... Um just generally interested in how, uh, uh, you know, video always needs an armature um, and that armature could be, you know, a, a, a projection, but it can also be an object. Um, obviously like these are now old fashioned TVs. Um, and so, I mean, for me, they're like time capsules um, and, and obviously they differ from kind of what we currently think of as screens in that they have this 
physical dimension. Um, there's CRT, cathode ray tube TVs. Um, and, and now everything is super flat, but you know, there was a time when like you needed this big bulky technology. So I, I like the objectness of it. And, yeah. um, and I like the idea that like all sculpture, um, you know, the, the object sort of positions the viewers, the viewer in space as also an object or as a, as a body. Um, so low to the ground, small, gigantic, like all of these different things yeah. um, that, that sculpture can be um, serve to kind of um, also act as a kind of a way of uh, choreographing movement and, and positioning the viewer as a kind of dynamic entity in, in the viewing experience. Great. Well, I want to save ample time to talk about um, a newer body of work of yours, which is called Incarnator. So why don't we jump into that? Um, this is a, and we can scroll through some of the images here. This is a very recent body of work um, on the subject of Justin Bieber and evangelical Christianity. And it's one of the most sort of direct ways that you've addressed religion in your work. Um, so could you introduce it for us and, and tell us a little bit about how you got interested in Bieber as a subject? Yeah, um, uh, it might seem like a, a, a bit of a left turn, um, <laughs> but really, I would say, you know, it's, it's continuing with the theme of, of looking at, uh, the kind of psychological underpinnings of um, of mass culture, um, and uh, in this case, you know, I, I this I uh, came to focus on um, Bieber in about two thousand and sixteen or seventeen, right around the time that uh, he he was in the middle of uh, a world tour called um, uh, uh, Purpose, the Purpose Tour. And he was about halfway through the tour and had experienced some kind of emotional breakdown. Um, canceled the rest of the tour, disappeared from public and reemerged uh, a few months later um, as buddies of a guy named Carl Lentz who is the senior minister of uh, a church called Hills, Hills, uh, Hillsong. Hillsong. I think it's Hillsong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Originally an Australian church, but which now has its, in a way, primary bases in big urban centers like New York and Los Angeles. Um, it's known for being really uh, a, a kind of next generation uh, mega church or mass church that um, is sort of fi finds its form in pop culture. So not like your parents' mega church that, you know, kind of appears like um, a bit other uh, to kind of the sensibilities of like uh, young urban people. In fact, the, the primary uh, um, demographic for Hillsong are young urban creative people and um, you know a lot of sports figures a lot of celebs are known to go there um, and so Justin reappeared as uh, almost kind of like a singular um, representative of Hillsong not directly but through his uh, association with with uh, the senior minister and uh, his his um, collaborations with the cultural uh, musical um, branch of the church. Uh, there is also a a, uh, a pop band called Hillsong, um, and they produce um, you know like really catchy tunes. Um, and uh, Justin Bieber has has uh, been a voice on on a number of their songs. So it just got me thinking um, about the, like the nature of, of like what this is, um, the, the merger of entertainment culture and, uh, and mass religion. Mm, I've come to think of it as in a way, 
less ideological, less spiritual, more just about communication, um, about receptivity, about lifestyle perhaps, and um, uh, about kind of, you know, how to have a better life um, uh, through some kind of like a management that uh, has, you know, different dimensions to it. Um, it's like a whole package where, you know, it's a way of socializing. It, it has a spiritual dimension. Um, it, it, you know, it sort of doesn't necessarily, it tries to avoid making political stances, but there's a political dimension to it as well. Um, Hill, Hillsong, the music group, um, not only performs for Hillsong Church, but will also show up performing for much more explicitly conservative Mm. Uh, evangelical um, preachers like uh, uh, Franklin Graham, the, the son of Billy Graham, um, who's more explicitly like anti-Muslim and, um, uh, and, and anti-gay. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a very slippery mix, but it, for me, it represents a kind of hybrid entity that is coming to the fore in, in society. And, and that's what interests me about Justin Bieber. Yeah, very interesting. Well, tell us how um, these particular works that we're seeing here came about, these wood carvings, what the process of creating those was like. Yeah, well, um, I guess another dimension of this project is that it um, is part of an ongoing interest of mine to explore history, um, specifically American colonial history through cultural forms. Um, and so the creation of this uh, work, which is ongoing, um, or rather is continuing to unfold through a, a, a series of collaborations, um, is, is, is a collaboration with um, the inheritors of a centuries long tradition of religious image making in the Philippines. Um, uh, so these are like, the, um, there, there are workshops in the Philippines that, um, uh, create wooden carved uh, figures of the crucifixion um, and the Virgin Mary and, and the, the child Christ um, and many others. And uh, they, th this is a, in a way, a, a kind of a craft, a form of craft that goes back to the origin of um, the Spanish presence in the Philippines in the 1500s. So a 500 year old tradition. Um, and uh, continues to this day. Um, it's very, you know, complex. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of a syncretic tradition. Um, it's specifically Catholic, but uh, there, you know, there are other forms that arguably um, dovetail into uh, um, uh, yeah, other, other um, kind of like code switching modes. Um, right. Yeah, so. It, yeah, yeah, that's, these are amazing. I love them so much. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you, would you prefer whether we watch the, um, the video for this work or move on to your newer work? Do you have a preference since we're kind of running out of time? Yeah, I think maybe let's, let's watch the video. Okay. I mean, uh, and I'll <laughs> set yeah. it up because it's not, yeah, like, uh, uh, the, the title incarnator refers is, is an old, is a kind of just an, an English adaptation of the word incarnador, which is the, uh, Spanish term for the craftsman who makes religious images. Um, and, and it, it specifically refers to the final stage of creating an image in which, uh, the wooden object is, is painted and, uh, turned into like living flesh, um, Thus, the word incar incarnation or or in incarnator, you know, to 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 make uh, flesh. Um, so uh, there's a video that accompanies this piece that's just really looking at at uh, Justin Bieber uh, as a kind of emblem of uh, a new kind of global figure, a new way of communicating globally. Um, like a new kind of infleshing that has to do with uh, global networks. Um, and that I, I think, you know, as kind of one of the first, if not the first YouTube child sensation, mm, 
and now we were seeing him grow up and yeah. live out his life as a kind of uh, test case of uh, a life lived in front of the camera, uh, like so many others. Um, yeah, like he, he could be thought of as um, almost like the child Christ who then goes through his trajectory. Um, so in a way, I'm, I'm thinking about mass religion generally, um, mm -hmm. and it relates to it, like to come full circle, <laughs> um, the loop in that, uh, you know, throughout religious ritual, you find uh, the loop. Um, and the loop brings you into the trance state in which um, you access, you know, a, a kind of communication on a on, yeah. another, on another level. So well, that's a great, yeah, that's a great introduction to this clip. Yeah. Sorry, what were you, did you want to finish? No, that's it. Okay, <laughs> great. So let's, um, let's watch the clip and then I think we can go straight into Q&A because I see we have some really great questions that I want to make sure we have time for. Cool. Samma arahang. Samma arahang. Samma arahang. Three times. Samma arahang, Samma arahang, Samma arahang. I'd like to invite you all to find a comfortable position for yourself in meditation. With your right leg on your left leg, your right hand on your left hand, with the index finger of your right hand touching against the thumb of your left hand, with your hands palm upwards on your lap. Or you can adopt any other looser variation of this position, which helps you to feel more comfortable for your meditation. The important thing is that you feel alert, but yet relaxed. You should adjust your body so that your breathing and your circulation are completely natural. Adjust your position to minimize any possible aches or pains. anything that might disturb the continuity of your attention. And relax every muscle of your body. Relax every muscle starting with the muscles of your forehead. your eyebrows, your eyelids, and take special care to make sure that your eyes are only very gently closed. Make sure there's no pressure around your eyes. Never squeeze your eyes closed. Close your eyes only very gently, in much the same way you would close your eyes to go to sleep. And relax the muscles of your face, your neck, both shoulders, both arms down to the tips of your fingers. Relax them all completely. Relax the muscles of your chest, trunk and abdomen, both of your legs, 
down to the tips of your toes. So that all the way from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, there's no remaining part of your body with any stress or tension anymore. If you notice any stress or tension still remaining in your body, then try to relax it completely. Because the body that is completely relaxed will have the feeling as if it seems to melt away into the atmosphere around you. Okay. Great. Well, feel free to submit any questions if you have them on that video, but I think in the meantime, we'll jump into the great questions that we have already. Um, so Stanley Wolukawanambwa asks, hey, Paul, I'm interested in your choice of subsidiary figures in athletic scenes of protagonism. So this is something you touched on a little bit. In Four Horsemen, the basketball players who are more often acted upon by the stars of the shot or in Carry Out of the Boxer who receives the blows but doesn't land any. Is there something in the spectacle of sporting action that draws you toward the figure being acted upon rather than the figure doing the acting? Great question. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> I must say like, yeah, uh, Stanley I, I'm, is I, somebody who I happen to be having a extended conversation with um, and yeah, there's, I'm channeling a lot of the conversation tonight, um, but this is something new. Um, I guess, uh, well, there's, there's a word that came up in the conversation, which is uh, the, well, the, the association of the loop with kind of the suggestive state of mind, uh, hypnosis, and, and the word is receptivity, uh, which is, I think, what Stanley is asking about. Right. Um, it's very enigmatic to me, but uh, I mean, to go back to the earlier conversation that you brought up, Marina, of, uh, of camouflage as opposed to erasure, um, there's this kind of interesting kind of... Uh, ambiguity about like what is happening in camouflage what you know uh, what does it mean for a figure to become the background or for the foreground to change places with the background um, it seems like a, a, it's it's an action but it's an action that is described by a kind of self-negation or like a uh, a kind of um, yeah like a kind of um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm associating self negation yeah. with this kind of being acted upon. It's really interesting. Like a self disappearance. Um, right. I mean, for me, like, you know, one of the things that's interesting in starting with Francis Bacon about um, the representation of the figure um, in that kind of like that mode of a kind of existential um, exploration of what it means to be human that comes after World War II um, in Europe, especially, um, there are artists like Francis Bacon and 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 like uh, Giacometti, who use the figure in this mode where the figure is being uh, intensely acted upon, um, and um, in 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 our own way, there through social media, you know the 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 sense of like. Um, of real doubt about what's real anymore, um, to me is analogous as a, a kind of like a really hyper mode of being acted upon constantly that we all collectively are in now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a sense of like, uh, I don't know, like where to locate free will at this point, given the degree of, uh, you know, um, influence that, uh, to control reality that the media seems to have. Um, so maybe my interest in, in these kind of receptive figures has to do with that. That's an amazing answer. Great sweeping answer. 
Um, okay, so this one is very timely question from Andrew Booth. He's curious to know what your reaction is to live sports now existing with no fans, similar to the imagery we see in your work where the players are removed or the audience is removed. Yeah, it's really, you know, um, <laughs> over the years, I've had this kind of thing that I've always wanted to do, which is to use the architecture of, of sports to like use a stadium as an armature for a video installation. Um, to do that would mean getting permission from a stadium to, you know, uh, to take over the stadium, say, for a day uh, on an off day when there's no sporting event happening. Um, and I've come close multiple times, uh, but ultimately, you know, it, it's more difficult than it would seem because, um, you know, the stadium is obviously, it's a monetized situation. And, and uh, I mean, I think of a stadium as, as a massive broadcast studio and that becomes clear on a game day when suddenly, you know, the cameras show up and there's, you know, 20, 30 cameras and that game is being live broadcast to millions of home, home viewers. It's definitely a broadcast studio. It's got like, you know, thousands of built-in um, speakers that enhance the sound of the crowd. Um, it's really like, the whole thing is an apparatus to create like a very intense affective mode, yeah. um, totally immersive, uh, totally ambient kind of emotional generator as a, as a piece of architecture. So to me, it would be just like the most amazing thing. Uh, shoot, I forget the question. <laughs> no, no, that was great. It was about empty stadiums kind of in the yeah. era of COVID. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, you know, uh, yeah, like the, the empty stadium has always appeared to me to be like uh, an amazing uncanny space yeah. for a kind of unexpected experience. Yeah. Now that is happening everywhere. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so Rose Salon asks, um, oh, hang on one second, I just lost it. Here we go. I'm interested in the video editing that took place in the late 90s, early 2000s works. I thought a lot about this when using content aware in Photoshop and image editing programs. Was this labor of masking or isolating the image's action something that fueled a connection to the development of the work? Um, absolutely. I mean, before, you know, before digital video, uh, I feel like I was trying to do the same thing, but in other media. Um, for a while, I tried to do it and uh, I actually tried to be a painter. Um, and um, I tried in a way I continue to try in sculpture um, to get to the core of what I, I, I find myself drawn to explore intuitively. But the moment I picked up uh, or, or played with a, a digital video image uh, in you know, the video equivalent of Photoshop, breaking the image down into layers, reassembling the layers, um, playing with the potential to, to do things like camouflage or to play with relationships like foreground and background. Um, there was something intrinsic about the materiality of that medium that felt to me like I didn't need to do very much. Um, Everything was already in it. I just needed to tweak it to reveal the thing. So there was this like, really like in a way, a, a chance discovery of uh, a kind of in, intuitive way in which this particular, like the abilities of video, the way that it's broken down into pixels and then the way that you could sort of like paint the pixels um, all seem to, you know, kind of um, naturally match with, with uh, or embody certain relationships or ideas that, that uh, I've been drawn to explore. Um, I, I, in some ways, I also think, I mean, like film, and really you could say this maybe about everything, but in a very particular way, um, the breaking down of the image into layers um, and the various ways that uh, um, the image repeats, that it goes through iterations and um, goes through disintegrating processes as it goes through iterations, um, all to me like have psychological resonances. 
um, in a way like, you know, the editing process itself is uh, a reflection to me of one way of thinking about the mind. And in fact, if you ever go to a hypnotist, uh, the, uh, as in, you know, to quit smoking or something, you will find that a lot of the language that's used when you're in alpha brainwave state is borrowed from the world of film and video editing. Interesting. Um, so in fact, the idea that, you know, kind of experience and memory exist in the form of images, mm -hmm. that these images can be reprogrammed, um, you know, if, if you have the right tool set uh, and that it can have like a, a real impact on behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have another question that's asking about looping and hypnosis. So maybe I'll read that one. Um, this is from Lori Meritas. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. She says, curious to know if your relationship to the work morning after the deluge has changed. That's a work from 2003. As an endless undefined sunrise sunset, it embodies loop hypnosis simulation, but removes the body or cultural references. I had the privilege to include it in a show in 2005 and it has stayed with me. Curious how you see it fitting in the trajectory of your work and the current moment. Thank you, appreciate the talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's actually happening in that image is uh, uh, a, a sunrise as in uh, over the water. So like the sun over an ocean horizon goes down and then a, a second image of a uh, sun rising over an ocean horizon are stitched together at the horizon lines. So it takes two half suns and makes a whole sun that never ends. Um, like the sunrise becomes the sunset becomes a sunrise and it just continues in a way to like circulate without going anywhere. Um, but because you're seeing two horizon edges stitched together in a way like, you know, all the ground that one would stand on has been, you know, uh, has been carved out. Um, and it becomes, yeah, like it, in a way, like this kind of non-space. Um, I, I don't know, in some ways to me, like those, those relationships of, again, kind of, uh, well, just like a reversal of, I guess, traditional notions of, of you know, where the viewer stands um, and how an image is construction, constructed into, in relation to it, uh, in some ways um, continue, if anything, to become um, more recognizable and, and sort of, um, relatable as, as we get into the 21st century. Yes, for sure. Um, Paul, do you have the bandwidth for two more questions? I know we're sure. a little over time. Okay, great. So this is from Kevin Wolf. He says, um, can you discuss how the piece you showed in the first greater New York show, which centered footage from basketball games on a close up of the ball, I think that's John 316, relates to your subsequent work? Does it deal with the same themes? Yeah, I mean, in that case, it's not so much the kind of um, play between foreground and background, but um, uh, like a play on focus, you know, it's using motion tracking in a way, um, which is like an editor's, which is editing language. Um, and now is, in, is, you know, extremely common. Um, but, you know, the very idea to like take a moving target and center it would you know then decenters everything else? Um, in a way, these are kind of visual modes or like visual operations that have been enabled by digital media. And in a way, you know, like so many inventions, visual inventions in the history of science, like they take us to places where our own eyes and bodies could not go. Um, I guess what I, you know, what that does in terms of, I mean, thinking again about like, you know, the, the, the under hypnosis, the, the under suggestion, how to change the image can actually change behavior uh, and to apply it to what you're saying um, about John 316, um, you know, implies that, you know, the, the kind of like the, the forms of disembodiment that we can create visually in an image now um, 
in a way, like they suggest to us uh, new types of relationships to notions of like the object, um, how we act upon objects, how objects act upon us. Yeah. Um, it's all very suggestive, especially if you apply it to through the filter of say like uh, commodity culture. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, one last question and this one's kind of a doozy. Um, you mentioned that erasing elements creates a gap in the semantic slash meaning making chain. Can you talk more about what happens when you break that chain and why you're interested in doing so? Mm, yeah, well, that's such a good question. It just totally goes to the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, all I can do is say that, you know, is, is point to the history of psychoanalysis. You know, in some ways, uh, the way psychoanalysis has been deployed beyond the realm of psychology in the realm of art is as a critical tool. You know, since the 70s or 60s, um, artists have been using psychoanalysis um, to create conceptual critical work in the vein of uh, feminism to explore, you know, the, um, the formation of identity to uh, look at uh, all kinds of ways in which identity is constructed racially, gender wise, sexually. Um, I would say that the interest in doing this uh, has to do with um, the same things that I see as being at the, at the heart of psychoanalysis that there, there's a, there's a need to critique a kind of um, normative idea which holds a lot of weight about what it means to be a person. Um, arguably, we, I mean, not arguably, like what we're facing in 2020 and going into 2021 is the exposure of the extent of white supremacy and anti-blackness in our culture, um, you know, like the same thing with, you know, the kind of just like systemic gender bias and, uh, um, and, and the phobias about like difference, um, just the extreme kind of like binary way that everything is set up to empower um, the few at the expense of the many. So yeah. I feel like, um, the disrupting of this of the chain of signification is is like a psychoanalytic process to further this very necessary development. Yeah, well, I think that's really a perfect place to end. So I wish we could get to the remaining questions, but I think we're going to have to wrap it up. And I just want to thank Paul so much for joining me tonight and for this conversation. Um, also, yeah, thank you to Sarah and Claire for their assistance with interpretation and captioning this evening, and to Amy for managing our slides. Um, and finally, just a big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, tonight is our last program for the winter Talking to Our Time series. Um, please join us again on Wednesday, March 17th to kick off our spring season with Charles Gaines, which should be great. So that's it. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you. All right, good night. Good night.